The narrative of that first day of the feast goes something like this. So we're setting this out like a, a panel in literature, okay? So A, you've got the first visit to the temple, then B, the cursing of the fig tree. Back to A, Jesus takes direct action in the temple. B, the fig tree is found to be dead. A, Jesus returns to the temple. Barren temple, withered fig tree, not separate incidents and it's interwoven like that so that you can see that the that what happens with the fig tree and what's going on with the temple are the same deal make sense can, can you see it when i break it down like that it goes temple fig tree temple fig tree temple there's a, a a temple sandwich around the fig tree the fig tree illustrates what's happening with the temple what's happening all leaf no fruit What else do we need to say? The established religious situation is a situation of all leaf and no fruit. And Jesus, the coming king, judges it. Curses it. Establishes his authority in direct and open contradiction to what was already there and what was wrong. Because it was all leaf and no fruit and the next day they go back to it and there is the fig tree and it has withered how is it withered it hasn't withered like any normal bush you look at any normal bush that withers away something happens to disease whatever something in the soil how does it wither it withers from the tip of the leaves because naturally a tree will put its toxins and its nasty stuff out of its leaves and drop it off in an attempt to get rid of it get rid of the threat this one has withered, not from the leaf, but from the root. The source of its strength, sustenance and life. God has cut it off. What a picture. So the authority being exercised then, authority is a claim in verses 1 to 10 with the donkey and the waving of fronds and all the rest of it. Authority is exercised in verses 11 to 26 and it's exercised first of all to purify worship. Jesus goes right up to the temple that first day and the second day having dealt with the fig tree, which illustrates the situation with the temple, he goes up verse 15 to 19 to the court of the Gentiles. I've put a little illustration on the wall there for you in the slide of um, the way the temple was. Uh, you, you had to be somebody to get higher up because status was a thing, you know, to get into the closer and closer and closer to the symbolic presence of God. And first of all, there was the court of the Gentiles around the outside where Solomon's porch was, Solomon's portico. Anybody could go in there. And then a bit further in with the inner courts, and then in the inner courts there was the court of the women. That's as far as a woman could go in those days. And then there was a, a bit further, you could go to the court of Israel, and the men could go that little bit closer, you see. And then you have the court of the priests, where most of the time the priests could go, but nobody else. And then the temple building, and up at the end of it, the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go at the uh, certain time of year and so on. Yeah? This is the outer bit, the court of the Gentiles, where anybody could go. And Jesus goes up there, and he sees what's happening there, and he has two major objections to make to what he was seeing there. The nature of his objection in verse 17 goes like this. He is opposed to their dodgy dealing in the temple courts. He sees the tables of the money changers because you had to use a certain special temple currency to make your offerings, which was a scam in itself. In those days it was being run as a scam. And then you had to use a certain sort of un uh, unblemished animal with the seal of approval of the priests who are running the joint to their advantage it appears and of course if you had brought one yourself from home it wasn't going to meet with their approval so you had to buy one there interestingly it says when Jesus takes direct action in the temple it says he turns over the tables of those who were selling doves and the dove was the offering not of the wealthy the dove was the offering of the poor person who was being exploited by the scams that the chief priests and the leaders of the people were running. Making sense? Using religion to profit. That's the first thing he objects to. 
what Antiochus Epiphanes, a generation before, had done by blatant idolatry, setting up pagan worship in the temple. The Jewish leaders had achieved by means of blatant commercial interest. Temple worship had lost its true focus, it needed to be purified again. That's something that was expected of the Messiah. But Ezekiel 37, 26 to 28, with which I'm sure you're well acquainted, makes it clear that the Gentiles' destiny is to be incorporated into what happens at that time that the, pur the purification of the temple takes place. So the Gentiles are to come in at that point when the Messiah purges the temple and cleanses the temple. Here it goes. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It'll be a perpetual covenant with them. I will establish them, increase my numbers, place my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Then when my sanctuary is among them forever, the nations will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel. When my sanctuary is among them forever, the nations will know that I, the Lord, clean up Israel from their sin. Zechariah describes those days like this, Zechariah 14, 21. They shall no longer be traders in the house of the Lord, yeah, but also the nations will put their hope in him. So, the second thing, the first thing that Jesus objects to is the dodgy dealing, but the second thing he objects to is the exclusion of the nations. The court of the Gentiles was being taken over, and it was excluding the nations from a place where they could pray. Does that make sense? It was their place, the nation's place, to come and pray. Shutting people out from coming to God when they are in a state of nature currently very far from him is something God takes very seriously and Jesus went for it with a whip and that's worth bearing in mind isn't it Jesus goes up against dead religion that blocks people out of the kingdom of God how scary is that barren temple withered fig tree Jesus confronts those who usurp authority over the apparent people kingdom of God to assert his rightful authority and kingship it's all about sovereignty it's all about Jesus is the one who has come in the name of the Lord this is the beginning back in chapter 1 1 of the gospel about Jesus Christ God the Son we've had that shown us throughout act 1 we've had it shown us through act 2 what sort of king we're having it shown us in act 3 authority is the issue it's God's authority that has been challenged by the authorities and it is following him to stand against that and take what comes from it And how would that be heard as Mark's Gospel was read that day in Rome, that first time? Jesus is King. I will extol him. Give him the glory, honour his name. Yeah. Yeah. tough thing to do in Jerusalem because others have nicked that authority tough thing to do in Rome because others had stolen that authority people were paying a price how is it in Llandeilo? there's a question what is our responsibility in relation to this? That's another question again.